Wakey wakey, Steve Long here. Today I'm stepping out from behind the camera to talk about air pollution and the cost of clean air. Believe it or not, Spaceballs, which is everyone's third favorite Mel Brooks movie, is a scorching satire about global warming, featuring a dystopian future in which clean air is so valuable we're willing to destroy planets and eradicate entire civilizations for it. Okay, that's a little over the top, but today, in 2017, air quality is a real issue. We've made some headway with international regulations and limits for greenhouse gases. But we've also seen car manufacturers struggle to meet those regulations, resulting in massive cheating scandals. The reality is, air quality is tough. It involves technology, international policy, economics, consumer behavior, and most importantly, money. So, Neil and I sat down to chat about his experiences working on Caterpillar's emissions program in the aughts, and what's going on in the industry today. It's going to get real in here, but like I said, it's a tough issue. Hope you dig it. Wakey wakey, everybody. This is Neil Shum, and uh, no, your video isn't broken. This is just audio. I'm joined today by Steve Long. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome to the podcast version of the show. <laughs> yeah, so Steve actually uh, is stepping out from behind the camera today. He's going to join us to talk a little bit about emissions and, um, you know, all those wonderful scandals that happened a couple of years ago with Volkswagen and Fiat sort of cheating on emissions. What a lot of you probably don't know is that between 2005 and 2009, I actually worked at Caterpillar on their emissions program for on-highway trucks and machines, which isn't quite the same as passenger cars, but we faced a lot of the same problems. So one of the biggest problems with emissions technology is that throughout sort of the late 90s and the 2000s, there was this series of emissions regulations passed and they were numbered by tier. So there was tier one, two, three, and then around 2010 and 2014, there was tier four. And for the first three tiers, every tier involves a really big reduction in emissions, both in terms of the particulate matter, like the soot that's in the air, the actual particles, as well as kind of the greenhouse gases. And so with each cycle, we're really like, it's like a huge reduction, like two, three X reduction in both of these things at the same time, which means new technology or new innovation that you've got to put into your vehicle or engine. And so it's a lot of work, but we were able to solve it for the first three tiers with engine technology. We didn't have to build anything new, really. But with tier four, things became a lot harder. So going into 2010, we had to put a lot more work into what we were building. Uh, now, Steve, you have a hybrid car. Yes. Right? It probably meets all the very low emissions things. It's, it's a slightly different program than for on-highway trucks like semis or construction equipment like a backhoe. Yeah. But... I mean, you wouldn't be driving this car unless you thought it was a effective way of, you know, making the world a little cleaner, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was the reason why we looked at any kind of hybrid in general. It was, do we want an electric car? Do we want to spend, you know, the price of a Tesla at this point? And we didn't. So we looked at the Volt and the process of reducing emissions, reducing our carbon footprint, reducing the amount of money that goes over to the Middle East, for instance. And so we kind of weighed those things, but then I really think that at the point of what a Volt offers, it it's a great car. It definitely is a little bit smaller to meet those environmental regulations. Like, I feel like that's why our trunk is a little bit smaller. <laughs> uh, the gas tank has a smaller size. Um, one is to, for weight. They had to fit the right amount of batteries. They had to balance everything out. So there's a out. cost to it. There was a cost, yeah. And I think it was what, like 20 to 30 percent more uh, for the vehicle, you know, than it would have cost if it was a pure gas car. Right, but is it cleaner than any other car? Is it necessary? I mean, like, is your hybrid cleaner than another hybrid? And that's the thing. I don't think that Chevy made that distinction. At the end of the day, that wasn't what made us want to buy the car. It was. Would you have bought a cleaner car if you had the opportunity? <laughs> I. Maybe. I, I really think that for us, it was a market proof. You know, it was like for Chevy to prove that people had bought the car and they could make more of those versions of those cars or electric cars. But I don't think, yeah, that the emissions alone was what sold us on it. So frankly, I think that's kind of the situation here, right? Is yeah. that with regulations being put in place, whether internationally or locally, it doesn't pay to be cleaner right. than you have to be. It's cool if your car can go faster, or haul more weight because it provides more utility, but I don't think that your car being cleaner 
than another car or cleaner than another hybrid is necessarily the type of utility that most people are willing to pay for. Yeah. You sort of take it at what it is. Richard and Neil know that I got a soft spot for the upper limits of spice, preferably hot sauces. My fridge is filled with the likes of Kajans and Torchbearer. So it's perfect that our sponsor knows a thing or two about that. They're called Spicy Fix, a hot sauce subscription box that is two tiers. One bottle for $15 a month and three bottles for $29 a month. I got my first set a couple weeks back and I got a really good mix of heat, tangy, and sweet. My favorite from this round was the Bronx Green Market Hot Sauce because I thought it was really good. Hard boiled eggs, turkey tacos, and my famous guacamole. You can check them out at spicyfix.com and if you use the code WAKEY3, that's capital W-A-K-E-Y-3, you'll get $10 off your first order. So going back to kind of the truck program that I worked on, you know, we had a lot of pressure, right? If every three to five years you have to come up with a whole new set of technical innovations to make your engines uh, clean enough to be sold, then it puts a lot of pressure on you as a manufacturer to do that. And, you know, you're competing with other people to, pr to produce the same things. Yeah. And so there's not a lot of sharing that goes along with innovation. There's kind of just a lot of cost. So by the time we finished our, um, our emissions technology, we're talking, you know, six, seven thousand extra dollars that you're paying for something. Right. And this is a tool, right, for, you know, someone who drives a truck. It's the type of thing that you need to do your job. So maybe it's kind of like a hammer. You're going to buy the $10 hammer or the $5 hammer if they can both drive the nail. Exactly. You're going to buy the cheaper one. So yeah. it affects things like margins, too. It doesn't help to be cleaner or a better hammer in that regard. Yeah. So we built a lot of technology that went into these trucks and we were able to meet our regulations and we got it to work. But I don't think that we necessarily did a great job because Caterpillar actually exited the truck engine business um, about a year after I left in 2010. So apparently we built a bunch of really expensive engines that were clean, <laughs> but they had bad fuel economy, they backed up and they broke down too much for them to be reliable. So we made people buy an expensive product that didn't work particularly well. Yeah. And I think what Volkswagen was trying to do was build a product that performed well, as well as it was supposed to, although they failed at that, yeah. at the price point that they needed to sell it at to still fit consumer demand and sell cars. Yeah. And so they kind of figured, well, maybe if we can cheat at this one thing, we'll still be able to sell cars. We'll figure out how to solve it. Yeah. Uh, I think the downside for them is that they built a product knowingly that didn't work, marketed it as though that it did, and then once they figured out how to fix it, they sort of lagged behind in actually fixing the problem. I mean, I can't say it was all right, but I kind of understand where they were coming from. Yeah. Now they just make engines for their machines. All right, folks, uh, that's kind of what we got to say about emissions. Um, basically, everything costs money, so if you want clean technology, you're gonna have to pay for it one way or another. Oh, for example, just as a parting example, New Haven, Connecticut, where my parents live, offers free street parking for anyone who registers a hybrid or a zero emission vehicle in the city. So that's great. These guys get to pay a little bit more money for a car and get free parking as a little perk. But uh, I'm pretty sure New Haven's are now collecting a lot less money in tax revenue, which means we're probably dealing with a lower budget for you know, social services and whatnot. So, all right, we'll be back next week with some more stuff. If you like this podcast format, please send us all your comments, email us, I don't know, Facebook us, Twitter us, and we'll see you next time. Wakey Wakey is our quest to start your day smart. We drop episodes every Tuesday morning. Check us out on YouTube under Wakey Wakey, Facebook at Wakey.io, and on our site at Wakey.io. Later. <laughs>